Um, <clears throat> my name is Megan. I'm an adult services librarian for the Aurora Public Library. I'm here today with Kyleen, who is also a librarian um, from APL. Um, <clears throat> we've put together a presentation about LGBTQ plus online archives that you can explore from home. Um, since, you know, a lot of the in-person pride celebrations have unfortunately had to be canceled due to coronavirus, we were thinking about ways that we could help people explore um, LGBTQ plus history um, in a virtual manner. So a lot of the locations that we're going to spotlight have both a physical location and a strong online presence. Um, I'm going to go ahead and go through the program. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to drop them in the chat. Um, <clears throat> Kyleen will um, be looking out for participation um, and we will get to questions um, once I get to the end of my slides here. So <clears throat> what we are going to show you are just some of the many online archives that are available. Um, there's been quite a few of them that have um, appeared over the last few decades, many of them established with a mission to build knowledge as a part of anti-oppression work. Um, these projects are a reminder that what we choose to preserve as history matters. Um, so many of them are focused on bringing this often hidden history into the light um, and making it more accessible um, for people, not just in the United States, but around the world. I've divided the archives we're going to talk about into a couple of different categories. Of course, there's going to be overlap between the different categories. Um, a lot of archives um, contain both art as well as historical information and biographical information. Um, but I've tried to pull out what I think is the strongest focus of the archives and place them in that particular category. So we're going to start with history and biography. And we're going to start big. We're going to start with the Library of Congress, um, which is, of course, the largest library in the United States. Um, you can find so much stuff in the Library of Congress that it can often be intimidating to even attempt to look for a particular subject there. Um, so the Library of Congress has created a lot of guides or finding aids to help people navigate their massive collections, both in person and online. Um, they put together a page um, specific to LGBTQ plus content. Um, let's take a quick look at that here. <clears throat> Can we see this page okay? Yep, we can see it. Okay. <clears throat> so as you can see, they put together um, several different resource guides. Um, the first one is just an introduction um, to the collection of papers that they have. Um, they have a finding aid for resources in business and the workplace. Um, they have a finding aid for LGBTQ plus sports and recreation, um, market segmentation, lots, lots of different collections here. Um, so if we take, for example, the sports and recreation research guide, um, it'll take you to a page specific to that topic um, and give you um, some information about um, what kinds of items you can find here. Um, so for example, we've got um, <clears throat> some information like most of the athletes represented here are contemporary. Um, since it's more difficult to apply modern concepts of sexual identity to those who lived decades ago. Um, these publications can be used to research um, the history and experience of gay, lesbian, bisexual, or transgender athletes, and the history and social significance of homosexuality in sport. Um, <clears throat> so um, what I really like about this is that they've divided it into a variety of pretty niche topics um, that is only possible when you have a collection as large as the Library of Congress. Um, they also have spotlighted several, um, the collections of several individuals. 
um, such as Aaron Copeland. Um, they have the Alvin Eiley Dance Foundation, um, Carol M. Highsmith photographs, the Cole Porter collection. So they've pulled out several of these um, individuals who identified as or were in some way um, contributors to the LGBTQ plus experience. Um, and so they pulled out um, catalog records for the collection um, and finding aids, for example. Um, so we, if we look at the Cole Porter collection, we can see that um, it's got 2,700 items um, spanning 28 containers. Um, <clears throat> they've got a nice contents list here. Um, <clears throat> music and related materials, etc. So basically, there's a wealth of stuff available to explore here. Um, as we will see with many of the collections that we're going to talk about, not all of it is available online because digitizing an archive is a huge undertaking. Um, and most of those digitization projects are in progress. Um, a lot of archives depend kind of on the kindness of volunteers, um, <clears throat> excuse me, especially smaller archives like ones dedicated to LGBTQ plus topics. <clears throat> so there's a lot of good stuff here in the Library of Congress. <clears throat> Next, we're going to take a look at some more, um, some more specific archive topics. <clears throat> Our next one is the Legacy Project Chicago. Um, this is a local archive. On the right, I've got a screenshot from their webpage that shows, um, talks about both the digital and the physical version of the Legacy Wall, where they collect profiles of notable LGBTQ plus individuals. Um, <clears throat> you can go visit the Legacy Wall physically. Um, there's also a Legacy Walk in downtown Chicago um, where you can and find information about these people scattered around notable sites. Um, this is a great database for um, basic biographies of many notable LGBTQ plus individuals. Um, it's a great space, I think, especially for students who want to, um, <clears throat> you know, work on biography projects for school or things like that. Um, <clears throat> let's see, if we just take a look in the database here, it'll give us individuals alphabetized by first name. Um, many of them have plaques on the legacy wall and it will show you a picture of their plaque. Um, It'll include a brief biography of them, um, including some demographic information, um, images if they have them, videos if they have them, as well as additional reading. Um, so I think that this is a really powerful source, like I said, for people who are looking for um, <clears throat> biographies of individuals in this space. Um, let's take a quick look at the Legacy Walk here. Um, <clears throat> the Legacy Walk is in Boys Town. Um, obviously, looking at pictures of it online is not the same as being there in person. Um, <clears throat> but um, once we are, um, <clears throat> when we're able to, when we feel comfortable going out and, and visiting um, the Legacy Walk, um, it's a very interesting um, physical representation of many of these individuals. So the Legacy Project Chicago, obviously um, they collect people um, from all around the world um, with a special focus on people um, in Chicago. <clears throat> The Gerber Hart Library and Archives is also located in Chicago. It is um, specifically devoted to the LGBTQ plus experience in the Midwest. Um, so they have a great circulating library. Um, not all of their collections have been digitized as we were talking about um, earlier. That's a huge undertaking. But they do have quite a bit of cool stuff online. They have several episodes of the 10% show 
um, which was a public access um, show in 1989, 1990, um, that was dedicated to LGBTQ plus life in Chicago. So you can watch a lot of episodes of that. Um, <clears throat> Let's take a quick look at their collection guide here. So much like the Library of Congress, they have lots of finding aids online. Um, as you can see, um, they have a big physical location full of items that um, can circulate. We've also got some of these collections um, available online to browse through. Oh, and this is new. It looks like they are planning to reopen in mid-June. While I was doing the research for this, they didn't have any kind of reopening date yet. Um, <clears throat> so the physical location is located in downtown Chicago, um, somewhat west of Loyola University. Um, <clears throat> so um, it's a great space to visit both online and in person. Outwards is an archive specifically for interviews. Um, they make videos and transcripts of the stories of LGBTQ um, individuals, especially elders and pioneers. Um, they have a great website where they sort of divide, <clears throat> they divide the videos up um, into, you know, shorter clips, longer content, they have some podcasts as well. Um, and they've also recently compiled many of their interviews into a physical book called The Book of Pride, um, which has just recently come out. Um, again, this is a great place for um, people who are seeking biographies of specific people. Um, I would just really, I really enjoy the aesthetic experience of their website as well. Um, <clears throat> I think that the tiles of faces are a really powerful depiction of all of these um, elders of, in the LGBTQ plus community. Along a similar line, um, the New York City Trans Oral History Project collects um, interviews and transcripts with trans individuals. They are partnered with the New York Public Library. Um, and so as you'll see, we'll pop up on the page and it is hosted here at um, NYPL. Um, and so what they've done is similar to the Legacy Project, they've collected photographs and brief biographies of the individuals that they've spoken to. Um, <clears throat> and then um, one of the things that I really like about this database in particular is um, the heavy metadata that they've got. Um, as you can see, there's a lot of tags attached to this one 51 minute um, video. Um, they've got the um, information such as where, where and when it was taken, um, and they've got it all laid out in a transcript as well um, for individuals who cannot listen to the recording for whatever reason. So the purpose of the NYC Trans Oral History Project in their own words is to document transgender resistance and resilience in, in New York City, to confront the erasure of trans lives, and to record diverse histories of gender as intersecting with race and racism, poverty, disability, aging, housing migration, sexism, and the AIDS crisis. Um, so there are many, um, shall we say, difficult topics that are confronted within the NYC Trans Oral History Project. Um, they don't attempt to sanitize or shy away from any of these narratives, um, and it makes for a really compelling experience. Oops. Hang on. I skipped one. Going back. 
<clears throat> there we go. The Lesbian Her Story Archives um, is specifically about uh, lesbian history. Um, this is another large collection that has not been entirely digitized. One of the things that I really enjoy about their website is they have um, an option for a virtual tour where you can see photographs of their physical location. Um, you can look at it by floor or by collections. They've even got their um, building layout maps here. Um, go through the first floor. Um, <clears throat> so this is a nice, a nice little virtual visit um, that we've got here. <clears throat> they collect mostly items related to the United States. Um, they do have an international collection as well. Um, and they have um, their digital collections spotlighted uh, in the header at the top of the page here. We'll take a quick look at their digital collections page. They've got video, audio, and photos to go through. Um, a lot of them are similar to other websites. They're oral histories, people talking about their experiences um, <clears throat> as in lesbian culture. Um, let's take a look at their online photo sampler here. So this is just a small sampling of all the photographs that they've got. Um, <clears throat> We can take a look. You can create um, <clears throat> on this database, this digital culture of metropolitan New York database, you can actually create a bookmark list um, and add individual items to the list. Um, <clears throat> we've got, <clears throat> again, cataloging and metadata information here. Um, so you can see um, this photograph was taken by Betty Lane. Um, it, it was taken at a gay pride march in New York on June 24th, 1979. Um, <clears throat> so there's a lot of um, there's a lot of great photos in here. They also have a lot of audio collections um, for Audrey Lord's public speeches, um, and they have. Uh, public access television and radio shows that were created to focus specifically on the lesbian experience or the LGBTQ plus um, experience at large. Like for example, um, let's look at Lesbian Nation. This was a 1970s radio show um, for the community. <clears throat> They've collected some biographical information about the people who were interviewed on the show. Um, including links to uh, the specific recordings that they appeared in, um, as well as the audio recordings themselves. Um, and as you can see, they admit the process of digitization is slow but steady. We hope to continue adding to this collection. The Digital Transgender Archive has a great website. There's a lot of really useful and powerful search tools here. Um, they're based in Massachusetts. Um, they're an international collaboration among more than 60 colleges, universities, nonprofits, public libraries, and private collections. Um, and they aim to um, kind of create a central hub for uh, transgender history online. Oops. Okay, come on. Oops. So they've got a great how do I get started section here, um, <clears throat> divided kind of into education, research, curiosity, and allyship. Um, so depending on what lens you're coming through or what you are particularly interested in, they have some information that will help you get started. Um, for example, the Curiosity tab highlights some of the major themes of the collection and offers a good start just for general browsing. Um, research helps you find items in different formats. Um, they also have a Discover by Location section, um, so you can check out materials uh, related to 
um, <clears throat> anywhere that's available on the map. Um, <clears throat> as you can see, some of the largest numbers in the collection show up in the United States, but they also have substantial collections um, in Europe <clears throat> and really throughout the world. Their tools are summarized down here at the bottom of the page. Um, if we take a look by collection real quick, um, they've divided it into um, categories such as academic papers, advice columns, um, specific publications, um, photographs from that were contributed by a specific person um, from their life, um, different artworks, um, <clears throat> I particularly enjoy the button collection. Um, these are buttons collected by all of the institutions listed here, and we've got great online listings um, for the different buttons that um, display their ownership, um, their approximate date, um, and photos of um, photos of the buttons themselves, as well as um, often some like interesting info about where they came from. This one, for example, is from a nightclub in Honolulu. Um, <clears throat> it says, in the 60s in San Francisco, you could be arrested for appearing like you intended to be taken for a female. So to prevent arrest, patrons would carry I'm a boy signs. And they're speculating that that is what this button was used for. Um, in Honolulu um, in the 1960s. <clears throat> so like I said, this is a really great and very easily searchable landing space for um, just a lot of transgender history and artifacts. Um, this is a very strong digital collection and a great place to get started. Making Gay History is a podcast specifically. Um, they are sponsored by GLSEN, which is an advocacy group for LGBTQ plus students in um, K through 12th grade. Um, they, are, they make the podcast out of New York and much of their material comes from the collections of the New York Public Library. Um, <clears throat> they also partner with an organization called History Unerased to make lesson plans around specific LGBTQ plus historical topics that are discussed in their podcast. Um, <clears throat> so for example, if you were to listen to a um, particular podcast um, and you discover some aspect of history that you're curious to learn more about, um, or that you want to discuss with students or children, um, History Unerased is a great place to get lesson plans um, and lesson materials that help you delve into those topics for a variety of age groups. For example, it looks like these were specific topics that were covered on um, the Making Gay History podcast <clears throat> that you can um, dig into more with this information. Okay. So as we've seen, a lot of these collections are vast and they include artworks within their collections. Um, I've pulled out a couple that have a, a strong focus on um, art by LGBTQ plus people specifically. The Queer Zine Archive Project is a really interesting um, and kind of unique space. Um, before the internet, um, zines were um, an important way for people from marginalized groups to communicate with each other. Um, <clears throat> they were self-published underground magazines. Um, people would um, run off copies, 
you know, on their, their office printer or at, um, you know, a FedEx or something like that. Um, send them through the mail to others or make them available at events among the LGBTQ plus community in their town. Um, and so the Queer Zine Archive Project is dedicated to preserving these zines. Um, and they still, um, they still make their own, their own zines as well. Um, <clears throat> for example, this is, a, this is a recent one that they made for the Milwaukee Zine Fest. Um, if you would like a copy, all you have to do is send us three first class US stamps at this address. Um, <clears throat> so not only do they save the zines, they also produce them. Um, this was started as a digitization of the collection of, I believe, two individuals. It was just their personal collection of zines, um, and they've begun sourcing more um, to add to their website. So this is probably one of the smaller digital collections that we've looked at. Um, there's not a huge amount of zines yet, but it is still growing. Um, you can split it up by years. Let's take a look and see what they've got from 1976. <clears throat> so here we have this 1976 zine, Dynamite Damsels. It was just 34 pages. Um, it's got some good keywords in here um, that you can click on to view other uh, zines that contain those topics. Um, and it's here embedded in the website. You can take a look at it um, right in this little widget here. And so this is some of the organizations that we've talked about are very well established and have um, powerful partners. This is very much a grassroots effort um, for a very particular aspect of LGBTQ plus culture. There's also the Leslie Lohman Museum of Art. Um, they have a physical building in New York City um, that holds the collections of two individuals, Charles Leslie and Fritz Lohmann, who had dedicated themselves to collecting art by LGBTQ plus individuals. Um, <clears throat> they also have digital collections online. Oops. digital collections real quick here. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> the search tools on their website are not as powerful as I wish that they were. Um, <clears throat> they do sort of, there's a little bit more of a pressure on this website to kind of already know what you're looking for. It's a little bit harder to just browse. Um, <clears throat> they do have this random images option um, that will give you some starting points um, to go through. <clears throat> yeah, and as we can see, some of their um, some of their archive pages have not really been flushed out yet. <clears throat> but if you are looking for the artwork of a specific LGBTQ plus artist, um, there's, this is a great collection, um, especially for the New York area. And then last but definitely not least, um, I wanted to give a brief spotlight to an organization that will help you um, locate LGBTQ plus literature. Um, <clears throat> obviously, as a library worker, I rely on the American Library Association for a lot of stuff. Um, they have a roundtable, which is kind of a smaller organization within the broader ALA that focuses specifically on LGBTQ plus titles. Um, they make, they put together great lists of books for children and teens of different age groups and reading levels. 
Um, they make resources to help librarians support LGBTQ plus patrons. Um, they participate in the Stonewall Book Award, um, which is a major book award um, for titles with exceptional merit relating to the gay, lesbian, bisexual, or transgender experience. Um, so this is a really great resource, not just for librarians, um, but for educators or for parents or for anyone who wants to um, <clears throat> learn more about um, different media that presents different aspects of the LGBTQ plus experience. Um, so for example, let's take a look at the reviews page. Um, <clears throat> they've collected here columns, news, um, book reviews. <clears throat> For example, um, Carmen Maria Machado um, recently wrote a memoir called In the Dream House. Um, it's about her experience in an abusive same-sex relationship um, and sort of the unique struggles um, in that space. Let's go back here. <clears throat> and then the rainbow book list specifically um, <clears throat> is for um, children and youth, um, <clears throat> children and youth material that has significant LGBTQ plus um, content. This list is put together by um, the ALA's Rainbow Book List Committee. Um, <clears throat> and so every year they put out a list, um, looks like this year's has 92 titles. Um, they're, <clears throat> excuse me, they also select their top 10 that they consider to be of exceptional merit. Um, they've got it divided into categories here, um, starting with picture book, nonfiction, um, picture book, fiction. So starting with the youngest kids and then going all the way up through young adult, um, young adult fiction. Um, anything, <clears throat> anything with a star is something that they highly recommend. <clears throat> and they've got here, um, in addition to prose works, they have graphic novels in here as well. Um, you'll see Lumberjanes on this list. Um, Laura Dean Keeps Breaking Up With Me, a very popular um, LGBTQ plus graphic novel title just released in 2019. <clears throat> Okay, so that was just a very brief introduction to only some of the LGBTQ plus archives that you can find online. Um, we've put together a handout that collects um, basic information um, as well as the links to all of these resources. Um, Kyleen is going to share the link to that in the chat. Um, you can also find it um, on our website at aurorapubliclibrary.org. Um, I believe it's on the local history and genealogy page. Is that correct? Yes, that's yeah. right. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and if you have any questions about this presentation, um, if you'd like to see a PDF copy of the presentation or anything along those lines, um, I put our contact information here on the screen. Um, <clears throat> so I guess let's see if anyone has any questions. Looks like... Kyleen posted the handout in the chat there. Let's pull up the handout real quick, just because we can. <clears throat> so here's our little resource sheet um, and all of, the, all of the things that we have talked about today should be linked um, on our resource sheet <clears throat> for you to take a look at. Okay. I didn't see any questions in the chat. Maybe I will stop talking for a moment in case anyone wants to type something in the chat here. Hmm. 
<clears throat> no questions from the Zoom attendees? Okay. All right, well, thank you for joining us for this presentation. Um, like I said, the recording of this will be available on YouTube as well. You can look for that um, to be shared on our social media. Um, the Aurora Public Library is on YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram. Um, please check us out. We've been posting a lot of content while we've been at home in quarantine um, away from our beloved library buildings. Um, so please stay connected with us. Uh, we would love to see you um, either at our curbside pickup um, here at our virtual programs or hopefully soon when the buildings reopen. Thank you so much. <laughs>